Hello, and welcome to the Mic Plus One podcast, where I sit down with industry leaders to discuss the project to product movement. I'm Mick Kirsten, founder and CEO of Tastop, and best selling author of Project to Product How to Survive and Thrive in the Age of Digital Disruption with the Flow Framework. Today, I'm joined by Don Reinertsen, product development consultant and the author of three best selling books on product development Developing Products in Half the Time, Managing the Design Factory, and most recently, the award-winning book and one of my all-time favorite books, The Principles of Product Development Flow, Second Generation Lean Product Development. I'm incredibly grateful for Don to take the time to speak with me and for all of us to hear his thoughts and his insights. We had such an in-depth conversation that I have split our conversation up to, into two different episodes. This is part one. So make sure you hit subscribe or sign up to my newsletter to be notified when part two is live. I hope you enjoy the discussion. So let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Project to Product podcast. I'm just thrilled to have Don Reinerston with us here today. Don is president of Reinerston Associates, former consultant at McKinsey. He has an MBA from Harvard, a BS in electrical engineering from Cornell. And most importantly, he's been changing the way that the industry thinks about how we build products for over 30 years with three best-selling books. So to me, when people ask me about moving from project to product, I said there's one must-read book. It's, it's not project to product, it's product development flow. It's got all the fundamentals of what I think as an, as an entire industry we've been trying to shift through. There was uh, one slide that Charlie Betts showed me once where he basically showed me this PowerPoint of all of these different books that have been come out of the agile circles, all of the thought leaders there out of DevOps. And then he said, Mick, what do all these books have in common other than the fact that they're on both your and my bookshelf? And I said, I, I think I know, but tell me. And he goes, well, they're all built on Donald Reinerson's product development flow. That's the one common thing in every one of these books. So I could not be more happy to have you here telling us some of what you've learned over, over these last three decades, Don. Welcome. Thank you. And just really quickly in terms of my own personal story around encountering your book, because of course I'd heard of it and everyone's saying I should read it, but I didn't. And I was in the middle of writing Project to Product when one of my, actually the co-founders of Tastop, Robert Elves, said, Mick, you know, all these ideas that, that we've had around the way that value flows through software product development, being a network, not being this assembly line, not being this beautiful CI CD pipeline that we see drawn on so many slides so often. Guess what? It's right in the middle of this book. And this book talks about all the things we've been wondering about, like queuing theory and the effects of too much whip and so on. So in the middle of that, I actually put down writing my book and decided I could not write another word without reading product development flow. So in preparing for this, I, I actually went through all of my notes and all my highlights. I've never highlighted any book more than perhaps some of uh, Peter Drucker's book, other than, than your book, Don. So again, thrilled to have you today. And I'd just love to have you start off by telling us some of your journey and how you learned that the differences between lean manufacturing and product development, the things that you talk a lot about, about how there's high variability work and low variability work, how things flow across a network rather than flowing across this linear production line. So if you could just give us a little bit, and especially for those people who haven't maybe not had a chance yet to read Product Development Flow, a little bit about your intuitions and just a quick summary of, of what you learned. First of all, I always tend to approach the problem like an engineer as opposed to sort of a manufacturing guy. And, and ultimately, manufacturing guys are about following the recipe because if you make the same thing exactly the same way a million times in a row, you make money every time. In product development, our job is to create a new recipe. If we produce the same recipe twice, it has no value. And to stabilize things and prevent all statistical variation, like Deming was in love with, it just fundamentally destroys the ability to add value in product development. Being an engineer, I was always sensitive to the fact that the change is what ends up adding the value. And from tinkering with electronic circuits from the time I was 11 years old and things like that. I also was very sensitive to the fact that if you make many changes before you try testing it, it usually doesn't work. That the best strategy was always hacking. And overall system design, you'd have certain sub-elements that you think were highest risk. You would go after the highest risk stuff first. 
with the minimum amount of work you could do to establish whether you have a potential solution or not. But that mentality of recognizing the need to introduce risk into the system, recognizing the importance of working in small increments sort of is just in my engineering DNA. And so when I would see the classic waterfall model for software development or project management and things like that, it just fundamentally struck me as being incorrect. And actually, it was in the early 80s, I was working at McKinsey. I went to work as the VP of operations of a diversified manufacturer, sort of an LBO company and things. And I was working a lot on improving manufacturing. So I read a lot of the Japanese works and I, I considered them to be absolutely brilliant. And I wondered why I was not taught about lean manufacturing when I went through Harvard Business School, since it had been around for about 30 years at that time. And it was producing effects Hmm. that we were totally unaware of. And so I started looking at that, but I, I looked at it in the context of what of this stuff is truly useful, like recognizing the importance of inventory, reducing batch size, lowering transaction costs, truly uh, leveraged. And what of this stuff cannot really be blindly applied to product development? And, you know, I used to, when, when people would tell me that Deming believed that you should, it is always better to present a problem than it is to find and fix it, I would always ask them, do you use the spell checker in your word processor? Because if you wanted to be philosophically consistent, you should teach yourself to become a perfect speller and a perfect typist. But in in fact, you make the common sense decision everybody else makes, which is when the cost of prevention exceeds the cost of correcting problems, you're not going to invest huge amounts of money in prevention. Usually, The economics favor prevention because you often prevent one time and you correct many times. But as the run length gets very small, if you're not going to be doing the things a large number of times, a lot of times the cost of correction is less than prevention. And so I'm really more about, look, recognize this is a business of trade-offs. We're often dealing with two competing economic forces And we're trying to achieve a balance between them, and that balance shifts depending on context. So that's sort of how I got there. I love a lot of things about manufacturing. If you go back to the early 90s when I was doing stuff and I would talk to people about you have cues in product development and you need to reduce your batch size, the response you if you if you went back and read literature in the late 80s early 90s about how people looked at product development you would never see the term q appearing in the process you would never hear the term batch size if you mentioned cues and batch size people would say well what do you mean by a q and what do you mean by a batch you know personally i think one of the successes i've had is that some of the vocabulary that I began to focus on in product development, like cost of delay and cues and batch size, has effectively given people tools to talk about issues they were not talking about before. Yes, and I think for me, it was just such an eye-opening experience because I was also a student of the lean manufacturing literature. I was a student of the you know, earliest agile literatures. You know, for me, the, the first book there was Kent Beck, Extreme Programming, which did talk a lot mm-hmm. about theory of constraints and manufacturing. I thought it was a brilliant book. But this reduction of software delivery to a manufacturing process for me as a developer, because I was, I was a developer this entire time, or through at least through those decades, it would always just seem wrong. Because again, it was, and it was not until I read your book, I said, okay, this is why it's wrong. We're trying to reduce variability in manufacturing to do the same thing over and over because it keeps making money. Whereas, as you, I think, put it so well, in 
product development and lean product development, we're actually trying to generate new information. New information is always arriving, and then we have to use that information. So it's just a completely different process, one where it's high uncertainty, high learning, and you're after seeking information and, and applying it versus one where you're trying to reduce variability and push the same thing out over and over. And I think it's become even more true for people lately that it now looks and feels like anything that can be automated in software delivery and releasing software will be, right? Everything aside from that creative, the design, the business analysis process is actually going to become more and more automated right now with, with all the automation we have in delivery pipelines, later even with additional AI being applied to deployment, uh, to orchestration and so on, and to site reliability. So I think that my sense is also that what you've put into the principles of product development are actually going to apply even more in the coming decade than they have in the past as all of these things, all of the easy things get automated. And this, we truly look at optimizing this learning, this high variability feedback loop. So can you just tell us a little bit about the differences that you see and how value and information flows? Because I think what, again, what I've noticed is a lot of people try to almost blindly apply manufacturing principles to how software is built. They assume it's a well-understood problem. They construct into a large waterfall process. And that's what many of the listeners of, the, of this podcast are dealing with, is organizations who are structured to function well with waterfall processes with high certainty, where you can actually create 6, 12, 24-month timeframes that obviously assume low variability because... Otherwise, you'd, you'd be baking much too much risk into those timeframes, much too much risk into those plans as happens, versus what you made so clear quite a long time ago now in terms of needing to think differently about the economics of software delivery. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I use the military analogy, particularly if, if people are in the defense business and things like that, of comparing the difference between a cruise missile and an air-to-air -air missile. And I, I say we use two different fire control systems there. A cruise missile goes to exactly where you tell it to go. So it's typically a subsonic missile that is extremely precise in its guidance. Are you going to go through the top floor window or, or the first floor window? And it's a perfect solution for a stationary target. You know, you're blowing up a utility in downtown Baghdad and things like that. That is the perfect tool for the job. If you're shooting down a fighter flying at over the speed of sound, we use air-to-air -air missiles. Typically, they might go Mach 4 or Mach 5. They go very fast, and you just keep them pointed at the target. The basic algorithm is stay pointed at the target and fly faster than the target. And eventually you hit the target and blow it up. And it's a different fire control strategy and not universally better, but better for certain targets. And I, I think what has happened for us in product development is we have been moving to a world where the horizon is no longer visible. We can't see the target on the horizon. And any forecast we make of the target will be there when the missile arrives is close to 100% wrong. The target will be someplace, but your ability to say where it's going to be is getting closer and closer to zero. And so we're now getting to a mode where we would say, look, I need the ability to steer the project while it is in flight. I can do a certain amount to speed it up. I want it to go really fast, right? So if the, if the missile traveled at the speed of light, you wouldn't have to worry about the future position of the target because, you know, it couldn't move between when you fire your light beam and when the light beam hits it. Increasing speed will solve some of our problems, but I think ultimately what we start seeing is the ability to steer while you are in flight produces more value than the ability of just brute force speeding things up. And then if you start saying, okay, if, if my development philosophy is to have the ability to steer the product while it is in flight, and maybe even after it arrives in the market, 
how do I need to approach the architecture of the product and my system? The answer is you're going to put in some excess baggage. You know, a bow and arrow, you can't steer the arrow after it's in flight. A missile that you steer while it's in flight has to carry extra fuel and mechanisms for positioning itself. So you carry that excess baggage. And that, for us as developers, that becomes architectural margin. When when we say, should I choose a processor for this design that is exactly my predicted amount of power that I need because I think I know exactly what the load on the processor is going to be, in the modern world, that is probably a irrational choice. I should choose a processor so that if I have to increase the load on this processor by 50%, I will not have to redo the design. And so you carry extra architectural margin. If your belief is the target is intrinsically unknowable, it will be in a certain range. I I have a confidence it will be in with this certain circle of probability but I don't know where within that circle it's going to be. Therefore, I need to be prepared for it to be in a number of different places. I think that just changes the approach to how you do the design, how you do the architecture, how you do the planning, how you do the execution. And it also ends up placing a great premium on getting feedback while you are in flight as to where has your target moved to. And, you know, the notion I can go off and execute this program by just conforming to its requirements is no longer valid because the requirements are perishable and they're getting worse and worse with time. So what we have to do is we have to refresh that information so we don't carry dead wood in our design and so that we we start following where the target is heading to. So a couple key things there that really resonate with me. The, well, first of all, the, I was driving through Arizona a few years ago, so decided my friend really wanted to stop at the Titan missile silo. And yeah. I, as we got the tour, it just, I mean, I think it's obvious to most people. I, I just had not realized this, but you know, basically the moment that massive, massive rocket left its bay, its underground bay, it was going to hit its target. I forget what it is, but just under an hour later and there was no stopping it so it was gone and then i think that is just such a perfect analogy to what i've seen i think what so many of us have seen in terms of the way that on the business and strategy and planning level the executive level how software initiatives are run is that i think it's kicked off and then you've got no control or visibility over what's happening and there's this huge mismatch because of course every person who's written software themselves or been on the ground of a software product or project understands exactly what you're saying is that you need to quickly learn, adapt, and actually build that into your system. So the thing that boggles my mind, I think you put it better than I've ever understood it is just now, is that if you don't have a way, something built into the system for measuring and steering it all the way you know, to that strategic level, you'll have made a strategic mistake. You cannot aim that precisely. You cannot, in a post-COVID world, it's even harder to aim more precisely because there'll be you know, more complex and chaotic effects happening with the economy as well. So what's really interesting how you're saying is that that actually needs to be built into the system itself because developers have that built in, right? Developers know if they're watching their burn downs and they have a feedback, their burn down charts, they have a feedback, are we moving, are we not? Yet what I keep seeing over and over is at the leadership level, at the business level, it's basically this fire and forget. And there isn't the adjustment. There isn't a way of actually monitoring and adjusting. And this is, I think, why we end up with these with, with this continuation of these water scrum fall exec- execution models. So the reason I, I always, all, and almost every time I'm speaking to executives, so IT executives, I bring up your book. And the reason I bring up your book is because it actually quantifies and explains the making mistakes in terms of economic terms that business leaders tend to understand, right? To basically provide them with some kind of way of quantifying. And ideally, of course, I think in terms of my own personal experience, it's always been about understanding cost of delay and life cycle profitability, right? It actually is quite simple in the end. But why is it that you think that these very profound concepts you've established, 
that so many people have actually understood and applied. My sense is, in terms of the way that large enterprise IT organizations, federal institutions, and others, the way they run, it's much more the cruise missile approach than actually having some way, some quantification of the dynamics of software delivery. And I have asked this question countless times, how do you measure the profitability of your product value streams? And every time I ask, there's just a blank stare, not an answer, right? Because, oh, well, we haven't yet set up our portfolio. We're not exactly sure what our product value streams are and so on. So why is it, given that you established these concepts so long ago that you think businesses have not applied them? I think software teams have generally applied a lot of them to the way that they think. They understand that WIP destroys their productivity and their, and their flow. But why do you think it's not yet been applied at that MBA level? And how can, I, I how think, can we, as a com- in the end, I think all, as a community, all we're doing is trying to help organizations apply your concepts. That's something I like, feel like all I'm doing. So why, and then what can we do to help today's business leaders apply these and understand these concepts? Well, I often make the argument that today's business leaders are using all of these concepts except not in the domain of product development. Because... I say, how do you do your next quarter sales plan? You're going to do a forecast of how, how many uh, units you're going to sell next quarter and things like that. And, you know, let's say you've got 100 big customers that are 80% of your sales and things like that. And you make a guess of this is how large the contract would be I would get from this customer. And then what is my probability of getting that? And you add together those numbers and those probabilities, and you essentially do a stochastic estimate of revenue. You don't end up assuming the revenue is either there or not there. You weight it by its likely probability. And you have a margin in your forecast. If all those numbers add up to $10 million in sales, you promise your board of directors $8 million of sales because you don't want to have a 50% chance of having egg on your face. You don't want to have an equal probability of failing and succeeding on it. There's an asymmetry between the upside and the downside. So I would say all of these disciplines about thinking in terms of margin in business activities are present in financial planning, they're present in sales planning, they're present in budgeting, if a company wants to have a extra money in their budget for contingencies, they don't distribute that extra money in every budget category. They don't put 10% more in every budget category because that will generally mean that the contingency will be spent. If you have 10% more, you'll, you won't stop spending until you go over that 10%. So what do they do? They have a margin account for contingencies and independent of where the contingency shows up, they draw that margin. And and, the analogy I would use in electronic design, I'm doing an ASIC. I don't get my ASICs perfect every time. On average, it takes me 1.3 turns per ASIC. How do I plan that in my engineering budget? Do I plan for two turns on every ASIC? That would build a lot of extra margin in everything I'm doing. Do I plan for only a single turn on the ASIC because I think that would encourage people to do it right the first time? No, that would mean my schedule would be blowing up. You know, one out of three ASICs would blow up on me and disrupt my schedule. So what am I going to do? I'm going to put some extra margin in my schedule such that a third of the ASICs could require a second turn without blowing up the schedule. And that good behavior, you know, instead of the mentality of prove to me it's going to take two turns to do this ASIC, and if you can't prove it, I'm going to allow you time for one turn, which is the traditional behavior in engineering. Now, it's got to be acceptable to put margin in activities that have intrinsic risk, and it's got to be acceptable to show that there is margin. In engineering, we shouldn't have to simply hide that we have margin in activities. We should be allowed to show it and to preserve it so that if something bad happens later in the program, 
we can deal with it. And I tend to have my the most progress with management on some of these issues by telling them, you already do this today. I'm not asking you to do anything different than what you do in sales planning, than what you do in financial planning, is that you don't have deterministic, you have goals, you work to the goals, you know what's most important. Uh, we want to do the same thing in engineering. But the idea of having a zero variability goal in engineering is uh, a bit of a fantasy. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. W- one time I was talking about, for about 14 years, I was teaching product development classes at Caltech, executive courses there. And I have a lot of different companies through. And I, I would ask, I said, you know, do engineers miss the schedule because they don't take the schedule seriously enough? Because some managers say, well, if only we could get them to take the schedule seriously. And I said, okay, so what, what would happen if you said, I will chop off one finger from your hand for every day you are late on the schedule, things like that. Could you as an engineer think of a strategy that would be capable of preserving your fingers? And I was teaching the class one time and a guy in the back of the hand sort of raised his arm and he had a hook on the end of his arm, on his hand. And, but he also had a sense of humor. And he said, you know, I used to be an engineer. <laughs> and I mean, I, I think the answer is, the issue is the intrinsic nature of our work. And if we built sufficient buffer to ensure we had no chance of risk, we would be late on everything we did. We would be, and and often I phrase it to people as, look, when you build a buffer in your schedule, you are trading one currency for another. You're gaining the currency of reduced risk. You're eliminating variability. So you're paying for variability reduction, but the currency you are spending for it is cost of delay dollars. When you put an extra six month margin in your schedule, you're spending cost of delay dollars to buy a reduction in variability. And you ought to ask the question is, is that reduction in variability worth the number of cost of delay dollars I've spent? You know, my my cost of delay is a million dollars a month and I put in a six month buffer, that's $6 million insurance policy on ensuring the product is gonna be ready on time. And well, what's the value of the variability that you're you're like, well, there's one particular feature that we think is high risk. We wouldn't be able, we wouldn't have that feature ready uh, unless we had a full six months of time for the thing. But what's the consequence of that variability, that risk? What should I rationally pay to eliminate that risk? There's a 30% chance I'd be missing a feature that corresponds to 10% of the product value. And I would be missing it only for the period of time it took me to complete that. So, so I'm giving up 10% of the gross margin of that product for a six month period. And in return, giving up six months of, of cost of late hours. It makes no economic sense when you frame it economically. And, and I think, you know, my, my point is not, is it correct or is it not? But think of the trades you're making, bring them into a common unit of measure, which I always use economics as the one to frame disparate things. And then you can look at the nature of the trade-off because I I think it's the, the discipline of saying, what is A worth, what is B worth? Do I want to trade A for B? That is probably the central way you unravel these problems. I I would just add, the problem people create for themselves is they are unwilling to quantify the value of cycle time. They are unwilling to quantify the value of risk reduction on a program or variability. And then they chase after these philosophical goals like we will have no technical debt in our design. So, so many key points there, Don. I think I want to go, go back to one of the first ones that you made, which is today's business leaders are already using these concepts, right? They're using it for sales. 
when I when I reflect on what you just said, as a CEO, you know, report doing our monthly and quarterly, and then our board meeting, the reporting goes through that. I basically look at metrics for two things. One set of metrics is very well understood, which is the sales funnel, the conversion ratios, the close ratios, the margins that are within that. And like you're saying, organizations and business leaders already understand those. And if they apply the same principles that they use to understand those, of course, they would have a much better way of predicting and making and decision making around product development. And especially making these trade-offs of can we delay here? Do we really need to launch every one of these things at this date? So what I've tried to do, I'll tell you, you know, right now my story with my board, I've basically tried to building off the concepts that you introduced, made the set of flow metrics and the set of dashboards on those flow metrics. And I review those with my board of directors every quarter because it allows them to turn into economic terms that they understand things like time. So end-to-end time to, to deliver something, things like the proportion of investment that's going to technical debt, which truly is this kind of margin, this kind of buffer that the teams have. The more that we increase that, of course, the higher the cost of delay is going to come, is going to result. So I'm now seeing it and then sort of my journey from the last year is that if we could give, because we know that there are a lot of smart business leaders out there making a lot of smart decisions around marketing and sales funnels. And if we could give them the right set of metrics and economics, we could actually help them again, not launch the cruise missile, but adjust monthly and quarterly as the market is shifting, as resources are shifting, as budgets are changing and investment is coming and so on. So and I think, again, you've laid down all the groundwork for how these things can be measured. And then one of the things that I've noticed is just the difficulty in, in measuring them. And then the missteps that people take, thinking that the basically time from, like here's one of the classic ones, time from writing a line of code to deploying it is illustrative of the economics of how long it takes to deliver value. Where, whereas I think as you've, you've said you know, very well, and even at the start of your book, we have to look at the end to end flow. We, we can't ignore the entire upstream side of, designing and iterating and the upfront parts of the of the development process. And I think this is where I think parts of the, the DevOps movement, even parts of the Agile movement, just look at too small in terms of how things are measured, too small a slice of a value stream. Whereas every one of the measures that you've put in place actually is able to measure the end-to-end flow. So my sense right now is, and I would like to actually you know, go into a, a couple of topics related to this in a moment, but if we can just provide leaders with a way of measuring flow end to end, a reliable one, a way of quantifying these things, and some of them are correlations, right? Basically, you know, how this set of features drove revenue number over time, those are things that, that there might not be a direct causation because the many attempts I've seen of putting a business case on every single feature that you deliver in software tend to be less used than the ones that tech companies do, which is to measure these things stochastically in in an aggregate. But is your sense is that if we could actually put in place this measurement, and I think I'm still thinking back to your point, which is that we actually have to build in and accept the cost, the need to measure, just like that air to air air missile, a significant investment of that missile is its telemetry and basically the feedback loop it has with its target, right? It's got that built in. So is one of the problems that the way that value streams and flow are constructed at organizations, fails to account for a reliable way of measuring. And is that one of the reasons why, for example, whenever I ask what is the life cycle profitability of, of every product in your portfolio, I get blank stares. Whereas any sales leader, if they ever could not tell you exactly the, basically every one of the sales metrics for every single SKU their field sells, they would be walked out the door immediately. Yeah. And I mean, one way I would probably phrase it to senior leaders is is that we are constantly dealing with stochastic flows of value in our sales pipeline and in our financial pipeline. And we've gotten very good about thinking of that stochastically rather than deterministically. But we're still putting on our deterministic hat when we try to do product development. Give me a plan. Give me an estimate. And we place this great emphasis on conforming to plan. And I think one of the shifts we're going to see significantly, essentially what we've done is we've said, 
correcting a nonconformance from the original plan is worth money. And it's worth more money to correct the nonconformance than it is to leave it present in the system. And that is a hugely <laughs> wrong assumption for a lot of things. And, and I, I often describe to people that success on a project is not pulling out the original budget spec sheet and schedule and saying, I hit the budget, I hit the schedule, and I hit all the features, all the performance requirements and things like that. I say it's like driving a truck, a pickup truck to the marketplace, and you've loaded your pickup truck with all of the potatoes from your particular farm and things like that up to the brim. And as you drive down the road, you see somebody has carrots on the side of the road. And you can sell carrots for more than you can sell potatoes. So you say, why don't I throw some of these potatoes overboard and I'll load up some carrots onto my truck? And then in your trip to the marketplace, when you get to the marketplace, if you look back at the trip and you say, everything I chose to leave behind was of less value than everything I added onto that truck, then it is an economic success. And an economic success is when everything you decide to leave out in the design is of less value than the things you decided to add or to emphasize. And so I think we need to shift the mindset in product development is our goal is to maximize the economic payload of what we deliver to the marketplace. Regardless, you know, if in fact that maximizing the payload is doing exactly what we originally planned to do, then go for it. But if context changes and technologies change while I'm going, what I'm really looking for is to people make good decisions to add and subtract things. And I think ultimately the measure of a good product, I, I'm a big believer in product development is delivering gross margins to companies, is that you know what you really deliver is a gross margin stream. And the larger a gross margin stream you can deliver, the more you can pay for the growth of the company and the activities of the company. And to deliver gross margin, you have to control two things. You have to control, well, three things. One is the price that you can sell stuff for by producing things that are of value to people. The second is the cost it takes to deliver that value, if, if, if there's an underlying cost structure associated with that. And the third is the quantity of people that you provide that, that, you know, are you providing that for three people in the world? Is it uniquely highly valuable to three people in the world? Or is it moderately valuable to 3,000 people? And so you're going to make trade-offs. You, you will never say the customer's always right. I'm aiming for total customer satisfaction. The key job in marketing and product development is, is always, who do you say no to? Because if your answer is always yes, you're going to cripple a product with so much low value functionality that a lot of your key users are going to be disappointed because you're going after these minor edge cases. I do like the gross margin model as a way of thinking about what, what is the measure of output from product development? The, the, what is the stream of gross margin you produce? Because it, it, what it does is it, it focuses on what is the difference between the value of what is coming out of the pipe and the cost of that stuff is that, you know, if you make choices that make it cost-effective to deliver value, you will be a profitable company. And probably you will have correctly priced the functionality that you're offering to customers. Now, I remember in the first book I wrote on product development, we used the term the fuzzy front end of product development, which was the time from when the customer identified their need until when you started working on the problem. And I always used to explain to people that a product development is not a race 
where you measure when you start and when you finish. Product development is a race where the winners are defined by when the functionally, functionality arrives in the market. If somebody is doing a two-month development program competing with a guy who has a 12-month development program, but the 12-month program is always getting to market six months before the other one, the guy who's going to win in the marketplace in, in price eroding and sort of ephemeral markets, the guy who's going to win in the marketplace is the one who gets there earliest from a marketing perspective. And I, I guy I, I used to know at HP, Dick Hackburn, used to say, my definition of a good product is I have it and you don't. And, you know, very focused on a market-based definition of have you met the schedule as opposed to a plan-based definition. And I actually think we have moved backwards on that issue in some of our current thinking in terms of saying, well, the clock doesn't start until I commit to do the work. And I want you to measure me from my commitment to my delivery to the marketplace. He said, well, if you delay commitment because there's too much backlog in your process, if you can't respond to legitimate customer needs that are high value because you've got too much backlog, don't call yourself a hero because your late commitment results in a late delivery of the product to the marketplace. Good engineering execution, but you really need to find a way to be able to staff a team working on an important issue while it was still foggy where the value is going to be added in that process. Because it is guaranteed somebody who waits for a market to sort out all its preferences will be able to do the fastest development because there's no uncertainty in where the target is. But they're not going to have the best time to market from a market perspective. They won't be earliest to market. Yeah, Don, I could not agree more. And I think this is, I want to touch on a few points here. You know, first of all, the, the whole point and the, even the naming of the book, the project to product idea was stop thinking deterministically, start thinking stochastically, like you do for sales and marketing. Not that difficult. We, we need to admit it. And the, the, the question is how. And so what you're saying right now in terms of what we measure and the fuzzy front end, the thing that I've noticed, because we've been measuring flow metrics, this metric of flow time, flow velocity, flow efficiency, flow load, and correlating them to business results for a very large number of organizations now. And what we're seeing is, is very interesting. So for example, mature products, the a higher flow velocity, so getting more features done, basically the higher volume of them with a reasonable and well-managing cost of delay, of course, because the interesting thing is with any measurement framework is you're seeing those dynamics and the trade-offs, right? We see instantly yeah. with flow load is just a whip measure. Flow load goes too high. Of course, velocity and time are affected. So we've now been seeing the interplay of these four flow metrics and, and flow distribution as well, which I can touch on when we talk about tech debt. But one of the fascinating things is for products that are more mature, let's say teleconferencing, right? Right now, the flow velocity of Teams versus Zoom versus some new entrant is going to be critical because the cost of delay is high as people are choosing their teleconferencing solutions and want end-to-end -end encryption and want all the you know, high-quality video and other features. What we're, we're seeing with organizations that have, let's say, you know, there's some new market development going on. If the value streams are not optimized for flow time and they can't, let's say, do the thing that tech companies are so good at, which is A-B testing of whether this feature is accepted or not, it's useful or not, as, as I think you've talked about a lot, without flow time being low, there is no chance of developing a new market. And then, you know, this other fascinating thing, or like you said, being first to market, right? You have to have some combination of, of very low flow time and significant velocity that you can scale up as, as you see the initial traction. So what I've been seeing these organizations do, it's basically take different business metrics because those are all there, like gross margin. And we actually use gross margin for immature products. For a new product, we won't use gross margin. We'll use a different value metric because this product might be pre-revenue, let's say, right? We can't maximize its lifecycle profitability. We're just trying to make sure that by investing in better flow and in more delivery, we're seeing another proxy, a metric that's a proxy for what would be revenue, let's say daily active users or some kind of adoption metric. Yep. And, so and you'll, of course, have tech companies do this with pre-revenue products that are pre-revenue for years while investors are pouring tons of dollars 
But it's this, what I found so valuable is exactly what you're saying is this combination of measuring flow and how you measure what the clock is for when flow starts and stops. I'd, I'd love to touch on this topic because it's that more than anything, I think I've seen to be a, a problem is when the clock starts. So I'll touch on that in a moment. But measuring flow and then how it correlates to results where for the majority of companies, I agree, gross margin is it, right? They, they, they should be in the end planning for that. Yeah. So. And, and so, you know, I think uh, you hit on a really important point, which is that when things are pre-revenue, you, you go get gross margin as, as revenue minus cost. And if the revenue is zero, that sort of messes up your calculation. But the intent is that revenue is there because it's showing you how much value you are providing to the world. You know, the, the world sends you money because they like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if they refuse to send you money, it's their secret language for saying, we don't care about your product. And so you then, if you don't have revenue, you got to say, is there any indicator that I have that is predictive of future revenue that I could use as a substitute, as a proxy? And I think that's the truly sensible thing you're doing is to say, well, look, if we... We have active users. If we're gaining active users, if they're increasing their use of the product, we have things that, while not perfectly predictive of revenue, are pretty strongly aligned with, you know, if, we, if I were to take six products and one of them has 1% of the active users, the other, the other one, I would probably say the one with the most active users is going to turn into the high revenue product. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's completely legitimate. I think this issue of start time, though, it, it's really a much bigger issue than people realize. When, yes. when, again, when I was doing the, the work in the early 80s and things, we would ask people, what was the amount of time between when they knew there was a need and when they staffed a full-time team on the program? And what is the amount of time between when they staff the team until they ship their first revenue reducing product? And that first portion, which we call the fuzzy front end, was typically 50% of the overall development cycle. Mm -hmm. It was taking as much time for people to decide to pull the trigger on a program as it took to do the program itself. And it also turned out that it was the cheapest place to improve cycle time because compressing the actual development process often involved expensive things or higher risks in the process. And so what we often got companies to do to say, okay, as you have to have a process for identifying a new opportunity where yeah, you know, usually I like the one sheet of paper saying this is a new business opportunity. People would typically have a new product development council or something, some organizational unit that would look at the flow of these new ideas and say some of them are worth doing a business plan on. Not yeah. worth investing in, but worth doing a business plan on. And they'd sort of structure as say, okay, so what are the key risks in this thing? What are the, the deal breakers on if I were to invest in this, what might go wrong? Is it market risk? Is it technical risk? Is it economic risk? And what can I do to give this management group a clearer idea of what the market technical and economic risk is associated with the thing? And that the agility of that front end process of saying, you know, you'd have this steering committee meeting once a month and they'd look at an idea and say, we can't make this decision unless we have these facts. They'd meet the next month and look at it and say, ah, now we've got enough to justify making a small investment in this product to buy information. Because I often tell people, in product development, you're actually engaging in two different types of economic activities. In some cases, you're investing money to produce a gross margin stream. But in other cases, you're investing money simply to buy information. What you're trying to do is you're trying to alter the terms of the bet. 
And that may be doing prototypes to resolve market risk or proving out technologies and things like that. And don't use the metrics that you use on products whose intention it is to produce a gross margin stream on the projects whose intention it is to produce economically useful information. You need to still think about how do I produce economically useful information, but there are a number of activities we engage in that are solely, I often use the analogy, I say, okay, you've got two envelopes, one of them has a $100 bill. What would you pay to know which one has the $100 bill? And you have $50 because of rent. if I allowed you to pick one envelope, it, it's worth, there's a 50% chance you're going to get $100 anyway. So you don't pay more than $50 to find out which on envelope. If it's a $1,000 bill, you pay more money. Are you willing to pay money for a 90% confidence you know which one has the 100 bob? Yes, that has economic value and things like that. And so I think we need to get people thinking more in terms of how do I trade money for risk? Instead of just waving our hands qualitatively at the risk issue, how do I think about trading actual money for risk reduction? Absolutely. Whether it's early stage product development, prototyping, risk reduction, I think exactly quantifying that is so key. And I just want to, before, because I want to move on to that topic, but before we do that, I think we both seem to have a similar concern. Mine is just based on this last year of data I've been seeing, which is the clock is not taking into account a very large portion of the work. And that if, unless we start taking into account, again, the economic picture is wrong. And I'll give you just a couple stark yeah. examples where organizations are measuring their cycle time, which they're often calling lead time, which it's not. And we can touch on that in a moment. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing that work is in development. Work is taking, I want to say two weeks to get a meaningful feature or four weeks to get a meaningful feature to market. But then we're seeing that upstream of that, where there's a bunch of design analysis, there could be you know, some modeling involved and so on, depending on the product domain, you've got weeks, you've got multiple weeks. And so more and more developers are hired and of course, with a fear of constraints, nothing is moving any faster because we're not taking into, into account the clock. For the flow framework, what I did is I just built on Dominica, the grand summarize some of the work from lean manufacturing. We've got lead time, flow time, and then the cycle times that make up the various stages of work. Yeah. And we've basically, I think, now got a metrics culture in many organizations, which is based on a narrow slice of cycle time and tries to optimize around that and then is wondering why nothing's moving faster. A huge thank you to Don for joining me on this episode. I can't wait for you to hear part two of our conversation. In the meantime, follow me in my journey on LinkedIn, Twitter, or using the hashtag SMIC plus one, our project to product. Don's Twitter handle is at DRonyardson. Part two will be released in two weeks, so hit subscribe to join us again. You can also search for project to product to get the book. And remember that all of the proceeds go to supporting women and minorities in technology. Thanks, stay safe, and until next time.